Hello, and welcome to the Partnership for Patients Education Series. Today, we're taking a look at a very sensitive and difficult subject with huge impact, diagnostic errors. The Institute of Medicine recently issued a report where they estimated that all of us will likely experience a diagnostic error in our lifetime. In fact, estimates range from 5 to 20 percent of patients have had a misdiagnosis. These occur in a variety of settings and have varying outcomes. I'm Dr. Robert Dean, Principal of Performance Improvement for Vizient, and I'll be your moderator for today's program. In this program, we'll exam examine the latest research on diagnostic errors and discuss ways in which healthcare systems can begin to address it. We're broadcasting live from Irving, Texas, and we're glad you're with us. So let's get started. Before we begin, let's review our learning objectives. After viewing this program, you'll be able to describe the issues regarding diagnostic errors in healthcare, identify resources available to healthcare organizations to address diagnostic errors, and discuss the ways in which healthcare organizations can engage patients and their families in reducing diagnostic errors. And now let's get to our very important topic, diagnostic errors. Joining me on the set today are two board members for the Society to Improve Diagnosis in Medicine. Dr. David Myers is an emergency physician now involved in quality improvement and patient safety and knows the demands of patient care. David, welcome, and please tell us a little bit about your background. Thank you, Robert. I'm glad to be here. Well, I'm a physician, and I make mistakes. Uh, I've been a clinician and a medical director since 1984. Uh, at a number of different types of institutions from small critical access hospitals to large trauma, urban trauma centers. Uh, I've been involved with an MMI, uh, with MMI an insurance company for a number of years as an advisor on emergency medicine and, and was their go-to advisor. As a medical director, I've been responsible for the quality of care of the physicians I supervise. And then for 14 years, I worked for MCARE, a large uh, physician practice management company where I oversaw the risk and uh, claims management for them and saw hundreds and hundreds of malpractice cases, most of which were related to medical error, or diagnostic errors. Thank you, David. We're glad to have you today. Thank you. We also have with us Sue Sheridan, a patient advocate, president emeritus of Consumers Advancing Patient Safety, and SIDM board member, who is currently the director of patient engagement for PCORI. Sue knows this issue all too well. Sue, please tell us a little about uh, your background and your passion for this subject. Right, Robert, thank you. And what really brings me here is, um, uh, is really very personal. It is um, my family members. We had two significant uh, diagnostic errors in my family. Um, the first error was that of my son, Cal, who was born in 1995, who unfortunately after five days after birth, he was born a healthy newborn. He suffered brain damage from his newborn jaundice because of a series of misdiagnoses. And, um, and so Cal now today has um, cerebral palsy. He significantly um, has significant disabilities um, and challenges the rest of his life because of the diagnostic errors. Uh, and then also my late husband, Pat, uh, four years later, um, suffered from a tumor in his cervical spine. It was excised perfectly. Um, and unfortunately, that pathology that was done appropriately um, was never communicated to the neurosurgeon or to us. So when Pat was 45 years old, um, he died. And uh, so that really made me aware of the, of the communication problems and the, the impact of uh, diagnostic errors, but it also made me really aware of the opportunity for patient engagement, um, both from the personal level, both at the organizational level, to partner with the healthcare system. And I've, I've had the opportunity to see the power of partnership with healthcare systems, with clinicians, with policymakers, to really prevent diagnostic errors. 
Sorry for your loss, but thank you for being here to help shed some light on this difficult topic and really your proactive approach to such a tragedy moving forward. David, you've had some personal experience as a physician involving misdiagnosis and diagnostic error. Can you describe that for us? Sure, Robert. Well, as a medical director, as I said, I had a lot of responsibility to oversee the quality of care provided in my emergency departments. And I remember two cases in particular really started me on this pathway to work on improving diagnosis. They, the cases both involved two young women, they involved young women, two, two different cases, both with abdominal pain, one of whom came in with what would be seen as classic symptoms of appendicitis with lower abdominal, right lower quadrant pain, uh, onset with a little bit of nausea, vomiting, a little bit of fever, a little bit of elevated white blood cell count. And the examining emergency physician made a diagnosis of gastroenteritis, which is a very common uh, diagnosis in the ED, and sent the girl home. She returned the next day, and unfortunately, what did she have? She had a, a ruptured appendix. And in discussing the case with him afterwards, I said, you know, here, it's a classic presentation. What was it about her that made you dismiss a serious condition like appendicitis and call it gastroenteritis? And he said, I just didn't think of the diagnosis. Well, the way we're trained, that's a classic presentation, and you'd be expected to, con to think of that diagnosis when you saw such a patient. The second one was a little bit different. It was a young woman, again, with right lower quadrant pain of rather sudden onset. Uh, the, a different physician examined her and determined that she also had gastroenteritis, sent her home, and lo and behold, she returned the next day uh, in shock with a ruptured ectopic pregnancy. And when I approached the physician about this, asking why he wouldn't have done a pregnancy test on somebody like this who had reported irregular menses in her uh, history, he said, I didn't think it was indicated. And I said, well, knowing what you know today, would you behave differently uh, if you'd seen this patient, uh, you know, knowing that she did have an ectopic pregnancy. And he said, no. And I was shocked by his denial of this. And I'm thinking, and I said to him, well, haven't you learned anything from this experience? Why wouldn't you do a pregnancy test? And he says, I didn't think it was indicated. And that led me to come to understand that there are issues beyond just the, the clinical facts of a case that impact on our decision making in, in diagnosis and lead to errors. Thanks, David. Both great examples that give context to the, the subject we're talking yeah. about and the human toll that can be involved. Besides the guests that are with us today, I'm also pleased to introduce Dr. Hardeep Singh, who is joining us today by video. Dr. Singh is a lead researcher in this field with the Houston Veteran Affairs Medical Center and the Baylor College of Medicine. Let's hear his assessment of the current state of diagnostic errors in the United States. So it's Hardeep Singh. I'm uh, Chief of Health Policy, Quality and Informatics at the Houston VA Research Center of Innovation and Associate Professor at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston. And most of what I study is patient safety related to misdiagnosis, diagnostic errors, and health information technology and how we can use electronic health records to uh, improve healthcare. Diagnostic errors has traditionally been understudied, but now we've got more and more evidence in the last five years, which has really informed uh, us about uh, how common they are and what their significance is. What we found was one in 20 outpatient adults in the U.S. get misdiagnosed every year. Uh, now, the Institute of Medicine report uh, actually further looked into this issue and made a fairly broad and bold statement that almost all of us will have a misdiagnosis in a lifetime. So it's a really prevalent issue. You really need to connect the dots between different aspects of the healthcare system to plot the diagnostic journey and to understand it. So let's assume I'm the specialist and I order the test, but really it was a primary care doctor who sent the patient to me. The computer will actually send the test result that's abnormal to not only me, because I ordered the test, but also to the primary care doctor because they are essentially the gatekeepers sometimes, right? Then they are the people who coordinate care. And what was happening was, I would then assume that the primary care doc would take care of the test result, and the primary care doc would say, well, you know, it's the specialists who order the test, so they will follow it up. And we were diffusing responsibility. And so not only this, we started doing this investigation into sort of how we were using technology and how you were using electronic health records, did we uncover the fact that when you diffuse responsibility and you make it ambiguous who is responsible for follow-up of this abnormality, things were getting lost in the system. 
Yeah, so the Institute of Medicine report, uh, Improving Diagnosis in Healthcare, was a very powerful landmark report. What it did was it really gave a very broad um, sort of overview of the problem. Uh, firstly, making sure that people understand that diagnosis is really a team sport and making sure that we uh, use a team-based approach to improve diagnosis would be highly essential. So it's just not about the clinician, but includes teams such as nurses, pathologists, radiologists, the lab, the subspecialist. So it's not just about the physician-patient encounter, but it also includes you know, test results interpretation, test performance, uh, communication of test results back to the clinician or the patient. So right now, Physicians are not paid to do thinking, they are paid to do procedures. Uh, in fact, diagnosis is not always black and white. There's a lot of uncertainty involved in diagnosis. So what we want to do is to use technology to help us improve the diagnosis. Technology should not come in the way as it has often done, uh, because right now clinicians are sort of still struggling with how to use electronic health records. Clinicians are overall spending more time in dealing with the computer, not just in front of patients, but even after they are, you know, out of the office because there's so much of information in the electronic health records. So what's happening is, if I'm only, you know, sort of talking to you for five or seven minutes because I have to keep seeing patients because I have productivity pressures, I'm going to miss something. We are so consumed with getting data into the electronic health record and we're sort of forgetting how we're supposed to be still talking to patients and getting the history, doing the right exam, uh, and so, you know, missing the big picture um, while we're so ingrained in the details of, uh, I want to make sure I get my note right so I can, you know, make sure that the emergency room gets to bill correctly. I love that comment that diagnosis is a team sport as well as his emphasis on an EHR both being a benefit and a detriment in diagnosis and we're going to explore both of those concepts later in our program. The IOM report came out in September of 2015. Estimates in the report vary from 5% in Dr. Singh's study of misdiagnosis to 17% in autopsy results, and another study shows misdiagnosis at an incident rate of about 10%. This represents tens of millions of patients each year that could potentially be impacted by mis misdiagnosis. David, your thoughts there? Well, the IOM states it very well. Uh, they opened, as uh, Robert remarked earlier, this quote comes directly from the report. It is likely that most of us will experience at least one diagnostic error in our lifetimes, sometimes with devastating consequences. And those of us who work in the field actually think that is a low estimate. To help define and research the problem, the IOM established a new definition for diagnostic error. What is a diagnostic error? Uh, researchers use one diagnosis. Uh, uh, educators use another uh, definition. And the IOM laid something out that uh, would help to study it and unify the approach to it. First of all, uh, what, one, what must happen is establish an accurate and timely explanation of the patient's health problem or problems and communicate that explanation to the patient. It's not sufficient to do one without the other. Both of those have to be done in order to avoid a diagnosis error. Also, diagnosis is a very decision-rich exercise with many nodes where errors can occur. In all settings where healthcare uh, services are provided, you find diagnostic errors happening, be it in the hospital setting, in the emergency department, in the clinic, uh, in x-ray uh, 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 services units. So it's really ubiquitous, and uh, we've got to do better on this. And you know, what I really like about the definition that you just shared from the IOM about um, diagnosis and preventing diagnostic errors is, is this explicit use of the word explanation of the diagnosis. So th th this, new, this new definition really does um, require that the clinician explain and have a conversation with the patient rather than just mm -hmm. a label or a complicated diagnosis like severe hyperbilirubinemia or atypical spindle cell neoplasm, which to a patient could be meaningless. So this explanation is really very, it's a very patient-centered um, definition of diagnosis that really creates this bi-directional communication between the clinician and the patient. I really, I really like that definition. That single word infers patient engagement. Absolutely, yeah. 
it's easy to see how uh, misdiagnosis and diagnostic error can occur in the process of patient care. Communication is a big piece of, of that, uh, that care and potential for error. Can you describe a little bit what happened with your family in diagnostic error and communication? Sure, and you know, communication just has had you know, a huge impact on, on both Cal and Pat. And uh, in Cal's case, um, Cal was born a healthy um, newborn, and when he was 16 hours old, um, he was noted to be jaundice uh, by visual assessment, um, not a bilirubin test. And again, at 33 hours, he was head to toe jaundice, um, which by guidelines sake is, is severe already. Um, but I was told not to worry, Cal was discharged. Uh, when he was four days old, uh, Cal became lethargic and, and floppy and his breastfeeding um, was deteriorating. And so I called the hospital and um, as I was instructed to do, if there are any abnormalities in my son's uh, behavior. And um, I, I communicated that he was floppy and, and yellow and breastfeeding poorly. And, and their first question to me was, are you a first time mom? And um, so my concerns really were dismissed. The symptoms that I was giving were, were clearly classic symptoms of the onset of uh, brain damage, known as kernicterus, of uh, bilirubin encephalopathy. Um, they shared with me that I should unwrap him, tickle his feet, which we did. Um, we later took him to the pediatrician that very same day. And the pediatrician again noted his yellow, significant yellow, matter of fact, he was turning orange at this time. Um, again, by visual assessment, no bilirubin uh, test was, was given. And he was diagnosed, misdiagnosed with an ear infection. And we were told to go home, wait 24 hours. And uh, Cal continued to deteriorate. Um, uh, we got scared, as you can imagine, and so we took him directly to the hospital and he was admitted. Um, for those of you who understand Billy Rubens, Cal's Billy Rubens is 34.6, which is very high. And um, again, there was no real concern, there was no real um, addressing the severity of his jaundice. And Cal started to arch backwards, he started to have a high pitched cry, he started to tremor. Um, again, classic classic signs of onset of, of continuing the brain damage from his newborn jaundice. Um, during the course of this, unfortunately, a resident had documented the wrong blood type for Cal. And so they ruled out, um, when he was first admitted, a blood incompatibility. And so that had a cascading effect on how Cal's treatment um, was delivered. And, and no one really confirmed Cal's blood type or my blood type. Um, and so that also had a significant impact. So this, there were several layers um, between um, OBGYN and pediatrician and several nurses and resident, and then we got a, a neurologist, a ENT, and several other clinicians. And there was a cascading impact of poor communication, poor handoffs. Um, and so Cal now has severe cerebral palsy. Um, he's hearing impaired, he's speech impaired. Uh, he can walk, but with a walker, and has lifetime challenges because of this communication breakdown, this cascading communication breakdown. And then in Pat's case, um, he had a pain in his neck. Um, he, he was a hard worker, so at first we thought it was stress-related, and, and um, we kind of dismissed it, but it got intolerable. And so we went to our local doctor, and the local doctor ordered an MRI, and uh, it was discovered that he had a mass in his cervical spine. And um, because of this, we were sent out of state to a, a, um, a very well-known neurosurgery center where we anticipated the care would be outstanding. And, um, and the care was outstanding. Uh, they took Pat's uh, tumor out. Um, during the uh, surgery, they came out to me to say that the frozen section um, indicated that it was a benign tumor. Um, they shared with me that it was a spindle cell, an atypical spindle cell neoplasm, and um, which to them meant it was benign. Um, we are, he, my husband recovered, we were sent home to live our lives, and little did we know that 23 days later, a final diagnosis, a final pathology, was made as a high-grade synovial cell sarcoma. Um, that document um, never made it to the doctor, uh, the neurosurgeon, or to us. It was filed in his chart, in his medical records, and um, six months later, Pat's 
pain returned. We returned to the position. They did surgery immediately. They, they determined it was a um, synovial cell sarcoma. And um, so this was another um, communication, big communication error where there was a local doctor involved, a, an out-of-state doctor involved, several specialists involved, um, family involved, and we fell through the cracks again. So that communication piece was just massive in both Cal and in Pat's errors. Wow. Uh, impressive stories that highlight a number of variables that can be result in misdiagnosis, uh, communication between team members, communication with the family, documentation errors, uh, incentives from our payment system to just do your job and not communicate. So uh, a lot there. And then of course how do institutions have a process to report diagnostic errors, both internally for improvement and to patients and families well, as well. And it made me really think about, you know, as a, as a mom and a, and a widow, you know, the what ifs. You know, right. what if uh, the pathologist, when he saw that this was a, a serious diagnosis, what if he had picked up the phone and called the doctor? Um, to have this kind of team approach in this communication, you know, what if, um, that pathology or a variation of that pathology had been sent to us to really close the loop because we now know that many diagnoses never reach the patients. Right. You know, what if that hospital, that healthcare system, had had a system in place for me to report this outcome? And so there were a lot of what ifs in that that I think we could capitalize in the IOM report that you just referenced. And to that effect, one of the other ways to impact diagnostic errors is through patient and family involvement. Dr. Singh has some ideas on patient involvement. Let's listen. So when you look at it, just sort of the three major players into the problems of misdiagnosis and diagnostic errors. It's the clinical teams, which include physicians and nurses, the healthcare personnel. And then there's this healthcare system, if you look at it broadly, and then there's the patients we found that patients really need to get engaged to address the problem because the general myth is if I have not heard from my doctor about an abnormal test result or any test result, uh, it must be fine. Because if it was abnormal, my doctor would have told me that. And patients assume that no news is good news from the doctor, that absolutely we need to dispel that myth. So a big push these days is how we can actually deliver test results to patients, right? So patients are now getting more electronic. They are accessing test results through what's called patient portals. And through these patient portals, then they can see, you know, here's my test results. We need to hear from the patient saying, what would you like your test results to look like, which would be meaningful to you? What would you like to do after that? So when you listen to patient stories in the research that we do in misdiagnosis, it's really inf informative as to what we need to do next and how we're going to be able to solve these problems. So most hospitals and most healthcare systems are now releasing test results directly to patients, which is a really good thing, but I think it needs to be accompanied by a couple of additional strategies to make sure we're doing this right. Firstly, I think we want to make sure that the test results that are sensitive, they're especially like if they are, you know, sexually transmitted disease or cancer related, we should be communicating those effectively either face-to-face, -face, maybe over the phone, but essentially face-to-face. -face. Those things should not be directly being sent out uh, to patients. Uh, here's a pamphlet that uh, may explain it to you a little bit more if you have any questions. or. If you... There have been instances in which the patients have actually seen a sensitive or an abnormal test result before they get a call from the doctor. And so it gets a bit awkward for the doctor uh, when they call after two or three days saying, patient saying, you know, I saw this two days ago and I'm just hearing from you now. The other issue happens is we want to be able to get the information across in such a way that the patient knows what to do next. So if you're looking at a whole lot of test results on a portal and you can make sense out of that data, it's not going to be any good. This is work in progress. 
I think patients have a um, right to access their test results, but we want to make sure that we do it in a meaningful way so that uh, the outcomes are the best. So yesterday when we reviewed this video, we actually had a lot of discussion following it. And uh, Sue, you had an opinion on this. Yeah, well, you know, I appreciate, you know, Dr. Uh, Singh's perspective on sensitive topics. And um, however, I really do have a different perspective because I think if there, if there's life-threatening lab results, pathology results, radiology results, I do believe they should go directly um, in some form to the patient so we can close that loop, you know, like in, in Pat's case. Uh, and in many cases, we know that, that the, the, the ordering physician sometimes never gets the tests back and they get misplaced or they get filed. So I believe as well as many other patients believe that these life-threatening results need to come to us as well in some form. And I think there's, there's nice precedence. I mean, there is a, the mammogram that when all women in the United States, when we get a mammogram, we get a communication in the mail directly to us that shares whether or not the pathology was, was it normal? If so, do follow up with your doctor in a year. Was it abnormal? And the, these communications indicate this is abnormal. Um, call your doctor immediately for follow-up. So I think this is one example to show how, and, and it has reduced, it has improved um, the, the breast cancer um, survival and, and follow-up. And so I think that that's one way that we could look at you know, directly communicating with the patients. Um, another thing that really impressed me in Pat's case is that this life or death piece of paper, this pathology, um, never found its way to us. Mm -hmm. But um, during the course of, of Pat's care for the three years while we were trying to save his life, um, we moved five times. And during that time, we, the bill for the care that Pat got followed us. It found us every time we moved. Why can't that kind of energy and system be put in place for life-threatening pathology? So that's, you know, I think it's important that we really look at this closely. And, and, and in terms of sensitive, uh, other sensitive information and what patients want back, I really think we need to ask the patient community, how do we best communicate and do they want this kind of information? Mm -hmm. And actually tying in this month's show with last month's on patient engagement and patient advisory councils, a patient advisory council working closely with a, a hospital is a great way to design a process that meets patient needs, still fits within what the hospital wants to do as well, and have that voice of the patient Absolutely. represented. Absolutely. Well, beyond that, it's, it's really uh, encapsulated in the mission, vision, and value statements of most institutions, how critical the patient is to the whole every effort that we do. Uh, in the emergency department, we've always had issues around uh, late test results, culture results that come back late for sometimes sexually transmitted disease and, and, and other cultures, and also with delayed reports of x-rays. Often the emergency physician makes a preliminary reading, and then sometime later the radiologist expert reads the film, and there's a discrepancy in the, the two readings. So we've been forced to deal with how to uh, address late results and discrepant results, and it comes down in many cases to a human uh, individual responsible for checking yesterday's uh, late test results and making sure the patients are contacted and told what to do. And we do it by phone, we do it by uh, letter, we do all different methodologies, you know, belts and suspenders, because it's so critical that it be a fail-safe uh, effort. It cannot fail. And can in I, this, uh, can go I ahead, make please. a comment about just your vision and mission, your comment about vision and mission of the healthcare institution? I just wanted to share that in, um, in reviewing some of the diagnostic errors with, it, that happened to my family with the CEO of one of the hospitals. Um, the CEO of the hospital and I were invited to, um, to give a, a, an interview to a newspaper. And the CEO initially was really reluctant and, and uh, to talk openly about this. And so I really encouraged her to get online, look at the institution's mission and vision. And that, you know, the word patient-centered was mm -hmm. in there, and I said, sure. this is what I'm encouraging right. us to have this dialogue. Yes. It's in your mission. And then we went forward with the, with the interview. So the mission and vision is really key in this. And in fact, we've gone beyond belts and suspenders. We actually <laughs> have IT-mediated ways of communication now, mm -hmm. right, and, and access to patient portals. 
So uh, we have multiple modalities that weren't available even 15, 20 years ago, and we need to really take advantage mm -hmm. of those. Mm -hmm. But they do re remain to be perfected. Having a portal doesn't guarantee that it's used effectively by the patient. So we've got to make efforts to make sure it's patient friendly, not just the letter of the law, but the spirit as right. well. Yeah. So this is a great segue into our next video, highlighting how electronic medical records and healthcare analytics can facilitate improvement in diagnostic error. Dr. Singh shed some light about what the VA is doing in Houston for this. You know, the VA has a very large database. Um, we have a comprehensive electronic health record that we've used for more than a decade. Um, so it actually gives a very nice uh, picture of the diagnostic journey of a patient. So when we communicate information, we want to make sure that we don't overload the physicians who have lots of data to look at within the electronic health record anyway. So we're going to have to make sure that we don't over communicate information and don't have, we have the right signal to noise ratio. So what we've also found is we need a socio-technical approach that accounts for not just technology, but many of the organizational factors is really essential to our work and is foundational for much of what we are doing in improving test results management in the VA. You identify the problem, you try to find a potential fix after you understand the problem, and that's where the socio-technical approach is very useful in understanding the problem and then building a solution as to how we're gonna get the data out and then who do we give it to in order to reduce delays in care. What we've been able to do very well in the VA is try to use the large quantities of data that we're collecting using data warehousing, building these algorithms, and then trying to make sense out of it. So we build algorithms and we query the electronic health record system to see hey, did how many patients out of the 250,000 patients that were seen at this facility, how many patients are really not getting their test result follow-up done on time? Our algorithms say that out of almost 100 patients, let's say out of 200,000 patients, that the computer says might be lost to follow-up, about half of them, the computer is right which is pretty good because you don't have to now review 200,000 records. You only have to look at that 100 records to see which one of these patients might be getting lost to follow up for their test results. We build these algorithms, we test them. If they are valid, we try to operationalize it so that we can get the information out and give it to somebody on the op clinical operation side. So now our challenge is, which part of the organization that we give this data to. And the organization says, well, this is just a physician problem because they're the ones who order test results and they're the ones who are responsible for follow-up. Yes, that's correct, but the organization has to be a backup. Data is no good unless you actually do something on that data. So if we're giving organizations or hospitals data about which patients are potentially lost to follow-up, they must put in place systems that can take that information and do something with it. So what hospitals really need to do, other hospitals really need to try to think about doing is how do you connect the dots between all your different systems of care, make sense out of the data, and then use it for meaningful improvement, and then be transparent about it. We need to hear from other hospitals as to what kind of problems they're having in diagnosis, how many test results they are losing, and what they are trying to do to fix the problem. How do we get test results from uh, the diagnostic service, or lab, radiology, to the clinicians? How do we then get that information from clinicians to patients? And so now the VA, I think, has a really good policy for communicating test results. And now what we're trying to do is, how do we implement that policy nationally in you know, more than 150 VA facilities? We've talked in previous programs about the use of analytics in identifying disparities in healthcare by different patient population. Dr. Singh talks to us about using analytics to identify those patients that may be lost a follow-up and better ways to communicate diagnosis to those patients. 
I think this is a, a really impactful way of, of using our analytics to better benefit for patient care. Yeah, and I had a great opportunity to witness, you know, an, an example of how a healthcare system can use data to, um, you know, identify and, and, you know, to identify and to treat certain conditions and diagnoses. And um, the Hospital Corporation of America, when I was in my advocacy years, um, we partnered, you know, mothers like, like I am. Um, we partnered with researchers, with the healthcare system, with accreditors, with, um, and uh, we partnered with Hospital Corporation of America, who opened their data of 250,000 babies. And one of our research researchers, um, Vidi Butani, um, they reviewed this data and they then improved how to diagnose their neonates. Um, mm -hmm. how to diagnose their, the jaundice and treat it in a safer, more effective way. So I got to see as a patient the power of patient data and how this can be used to improve diagnostic errors. Well, I think we're on the verge of a, a new era in that sense. Every institution, even small ones, have tremendous amounts of data in those server files. What remains to be done is to use them. Now, IT, as Robert pointed out, can be our friend and our foe, and it is a big problem right now. Uh, in fact, it was addressed by the IOM report in their goal number three where they said specifically that government and vendors together have to do more to make IT work for the patient and the clinician. Standards have to be established for health IT vendors. It, vendors. it has not been enough to leave it to the vendors to figure out uh, what should be done. And the government has specified that the IT systems must be usable. It has to incorporate human factors. How do humans think? How do humans act? How do humans behave? It must allow for measurement, the very thing we're talking about here. It has to fit into the workflow, a critical point. And it also has to provide clinical decision support to deal with human failings and hu human limitations. And furthermore, it has to facilitate the timely flow of information among providers, between providers and patients, and between researchers and educators who will ultimately turn all of that raw data into better uh, patient care in the form of improved diagnosis. And as we've discussed, having the data is one thing. But using the data for change, using the data for improvement is the hardest Absolutely. thing. Absolutely. And that's, I think, where it, going across the country, many organizations get stuck into the real work of using data for change. So, uh, Besides data, there are many other resources available. And Dr. Singh is going to identify some of those in this next video. Safer Guides are a wonderful resource that I think still hasn't been leveraged adequately by hospitals and practices across the country. What it encourages people to do is to proactively do a self-assessment on their policies and practices and see what you're doing and where are the strengths and where are the improvement opportunities. Safer Guides make you just think what are the right things to do in improving a process or a problem or making sure that we're addressing one and I would encourage all hospitals to use the uh, safer guide for test results to just to see what are the things they can do, what are they doing now, and what they can do in the future to improve their processes and care. And they use a very broad socio-technical approach as well. So it's just not about the technology, but there's lots of issues about workflow and organization that are also in safer guides that really encourage people to think beyond just the te technical part. Those safer guides are in your supplement with other resources that your organization can use. I think the take home message really here is using these guidelines you can identify high risk and high priority safety practices and with the guidelines improve those processes in your organization for both diagnosis and communication. Those processes we can then link with other processes such as OPPE, FPPE, and peer review that really bring into uh, a consolidated area misdiagnosis, uh, uh, wrong diagnosis, or lack of communication and bring it home into what we're doing with our clinicians. Well, look, Robert, you're exactly right. It's not enough to complain about how hard it is to herd cats. We have got to make the system serve the patients and the providers, the physicians and others who are in the direct patient care. And we've got to figure out how these things are going to help them in their diagnostic uh, effort. 
So we've got to overcome those barriers. And there are a, a number of specific things that can be done. As Robert pointed out, using OPPE and FPPE to look at how physicians are providing care and to, to give feedback about when they're doing it right and when they're not doing it right. Not in a punitive way, but in an educational way. But it really begins at the beginning. When you're onboarding physicians, you've got to orient them to the institution's mission and vision and values. And then make sure they understand how you will be supporting them at that one-on-one -on -one patient doctor interface where really everything happens are you providing cds clinical decision support tools to help them do a better job to remind them about differential diagnoses which by the way is very commonly missing in uh, cases where diagnostic errors happen because of time constraints or knowledge constraints or whatever physicians are not generating the old differential diagnosis list that we were all taught in medical school school to do that you don't just come up with one diagnosis and run with it you come up with several and systematically rule in and rule out what is the right one you need to make sure that the the opportunity to do a proper history and physical again very basic is there for the clinicians and then how do we evaluate them how do we do it in a non-punitive way so we get their buy-in and I, I, I just want to say that I think here, non-punitive, as we tie that in with OPPE, FPPE, and peer review, having a just culture that allows people to come forward with mistakes and know that in an honest, transparent, and consistent way they'll be dealt with is the right way to create the culture that addresses these. Sue, other thoughts? Oh, I've got several thoughts. Um, <laughs> yeah, the first that comes to mind is something very concrete for healthcare institutions um, is please know patient safety goal number two of the Joint Commission. Um, and that is to ensure that you have uh, written procedures to report critical results of tests and diagnostic procedures on a timely basis. And so we patients really rely on the Joint Commission to keep us safe. So we want to know, do you have written procedures to ensure the timely communication of clinical test results? Have you implemented these written procedures? Who is communicating to who? Um, and have you evaluated the timeliness of the communication of these critical life-threatening um, diagnostic uh, tests? So this is important for you to ensure that you know this patient safety goal from the Joint Commission. Also, I want to share that um, you know, at the WHO, they did some research and they wanted to find out what would it take for patients to get engaged in ensuring better outcomes. The answer was an invitation. The, and this was a response from 59 countries. So healthcare institutions, invite your patients and their caregivers to participate in their care. You want them to be your extra eyes and ears to really help prevent diagnostic errors. Um, invite them to collect their documents make it easy for them to collect their documents, um, invite them to look into their charts. Again, that's another opportunity to be, for the patients to be a true partner on the, on, the, uh, on the care team. And like open notes, for those of you who aren't participating in it, open notes is, a, is, is showing to, to be a very effective way to uh, potentially reduce uh, diagnostic errors. And patients and verify what's in those notes. That they verify. Again, there are an extra set of eyes. And there's actually, in terms of open notes and making sure that test results are available to patients there, you know, there's always a little concern, especially from the healthcare professionals, that this may, may cause too much angst. But actually, there's research to show that when patients have access to open notes, to their, you know, they get um, access to their test results, that this actually improves um, confidence in the patient and that it, it increased trust in our healthcare system. Um, another uh, step that uh, healthcare institutions and hospitals can take is utilize your patient and family advisory committees. And if you don't have one, this is a great time to consider um, creating one. They've got the, the wisdom of the patient and the patient community to really help look at how do we prevent diagnostic errors or how do we create patient materials through the patient, patient lens with those um, patient and fi family advisory councils. Um, and lastly, know the CMS patient and family engagement metrics. Now the HENS know about this and so really look at these um, and on those metrics one of them is um, do you have a patient family advisory council um, and do you have patients on your governance? I think this can again create that partnership and that dialogue and to really look collectively at this problem of diagnostic errors. 
the metrics that CMS is looking at for patient and family engagement, it's important to CMS, so you know that, and it's also important to patients. Um, another opportunity in hospitals, um, when there is a diagnostic error, and there will be diagnostic errors, something that you can do, and, and many of you may be familiar with this, but include the patient in the root cause analysis when that happens, because the patient is the only constant in a diagnostic error. We see the medical error, the diagnostic error from the very beginning to the very end tap that wisdom of the patient and help create a root cause analysis that really tells the whole story. Can I just emphasize something Sue has said, and that is at the 30,000 foot level, the, your board and your executive team should listen to the patient at that level as you're setting policy and learning about how your in institution can better serve patients. Just as we're doing at the interface where the doctor and patient are together, the old mantra was in medical school, if you don't know the diagnosis by the time you finish talking to the patient, go back and talk to the patient some more. In other words, go back and listen to the patient again. The answers are there if we're only smart enough and tuned in enough to listen to them. Before we transition here, I just want to come back to your first point and one of the eight specific recommendations of the IOM report is for accreditation bodies to hold hospitals responsible for processes that identify misdiagnosis and diagnostic errors. And so this is another thing for our institutions to begin to think about, how are we gonna develop those processes, not only root cause, mm -hmm. but looking at our communication amongst care team members and where did we have that fallout and, and how can we improve that moving yeah. forward. So. And I think there's a great opportunity, you know, when we talk about patient engagement, for patients and their caregivers to engage in helping create these processes. I mean, patients have been engaged in re-engineering processes where they have better outcomes. David, what portion of medical errors are accounted for by diagnostic errors? Well, they're a huge component, actually. Uh, there's a study done that looked at 25 years worth of data from the National Practitioner Data Bank. Uh, a couple of years ago, this study was published. And they looked at what turned out to be 350,000 uh, diagnostic errors in the universe uh, or the total was 350,000, and uh, diagnostic errors represented, as you can see on this pie chart, uh, the blue in the upper right hand from noon to three, uh, it's just about 30%. The largest percentage of uh, money paid out uh, was based on diagnostic errors. And of course, the largest amount of money, uh, as well as the largest number, were related to diagnostic errors. And one other point, diagnostic errors tend to be more expensive than the average claim to settle. Uh, surgical and medication errors and those other uh, cases tend to be less costly, so they are disproportionately paid out uh, to settle claims around diagnostic errors. Great information. We have a few questions already from the audience, so let's get to those. Sue, the first one is for you. With hard-earned lessons with the healthcare system, what do you require now from providers in terms of sharing notes, diagnostic test results, and access to EHRs, et cetera? Great question. Well, I require them all. Um, you know, when it's it's now, you know, a, a, a it's more than a habit. It's ingrained in me now. When I um, have a relationship with a um, a clinician, first of all, it is a relationship. It's a partnership. And right up front, I share this is a partnership, and that I'll want to collect all documents. Um, that I'll want to be able to ask questions. So I do collect. I have a binder for all my family members now, and I collect all. Um, uh, pathologies, test results. Um, we are active in patient portals when there are patient portals, um, and so that's now just it's just a it's just how we my family goes about healthcare as a partnership, collecting all documents, asking questions, and accessing portals when they're there. Great. Uh, second question: What can families do when, despite being polite, they are viewed as adversarial when they bring up hospital errors? And I, I guess I would expand this to sometimes you're not really conscious of how emotional you mm -hmm. are as a family member. You're angry, hurt. Mm -hmm. um, so both being polite and sometimes when emotion takes over, how can we help families get the message across? 
Well, uh, it's very interesting this question is raised because about three weeks ago, a study was published on the difficult patient and how diagnostic errors tend to be more common in those categories of patients because doctors become defensive, doctors don't want to pay the same amount of attention to them, and so they are at higher risk of diagnostic errors. Finding the right point on the fine line as to where to be adversarial and where to be collaborative is a very difficult thing, and I would ask Sue yeah. maybe to comment a little bit about that. And, and first of all, I would say when there is um, a diagnostic error, and especially when there's harm, you know, it's okay to be emotional. It is a very emotional event. So I would say that um, we don't want the patient community to feel that when there's harm, they, that they can't express the impact that that's had on them. We absolutely need to be able to do that. But what our healthcare system has not done is we have not created pathways for a dialogue. Um, usually doors shut when there's a bad outcome due to a diagnostic error. So what we need to do with healthcare systems to do is we need to create that pathway. Where can we report this? Um, how can we have a dialogue when there is a diagnostic error? And, and I think the healthcare system has to understand that we will be emotional. We will be upset. We, will can, we can even be angry. But the, the important part is that, as we know, the first thing what patients want when there's been a diagnostic error is that this doesn't happen again. So how to create these pathways, these reporting systems, these listening opportunities to learn from the patient community because that's really what we want. And, and for me, I see it as a great opportunity to engage a patient advisor as well. Absolutely. So yep. a, a somewhat neutral body, mm -hmm. someone who's been a patient, maybe had a, a not great experience or a great experience. Um, or engage social workers. But there are resources that we can bring to help families in articulating uh, both how upset they are as well as understanding what er error occurred and how it occurred. Absolutely, and I, I can honestly say I wish that the hospitals where um, Pat and Cal um, experienced their diagnostic error, I wish those hospitals had had a patient family advisor council because that's exactly what I wanted to go to to go talk to like people like me first about the diagnostic error. So um, again, I reinforce the importance of having a patient family advisory council to, to be part of this journey. Just one brief comment about that. I, I know you're probably thinking, well, my risk manager or my defense attorney group would never allow me to do this. And we're all struggling with how to deal with dis disclosure and apology now. And it's something that has to be settled at a much higher level than the individual hospital. But what an administrator can do today is talk to the risk management people and figure out how you might be more welcoming to getting information and working on your disclosure policies so that, again, they don't meet just the letter of the law, but actually the the spirit of the law and open up to getting this kind of feedback. So this next question ties in nicely with what we're talking about. Uh, in our current system with having multiple Swiss cheese holes, <laughs> a high reliability uh, concept, what is the ideal role and explicit behaviors of a patient in helping to protect themselves against diagnostic errors? So how can patients mm -hmm. help in pre preventing diagnostic errors? Mm -hmm. I'll start with that because there's actually at two levels, I would say. Um, when we talk about patient engagement um, in prevention of diagnostic errors, it's at that point of care, that personal, I'm going to be engaged, I'm going to ask questions, I'm going to do research on what I have or think I might have. Um, the hospitals can help direct patients to credible websites because patients will go on the web. And so if you can help direct us to you know credible websites where we can be your partner in trying to to um, prevent diagnostic errors. Again, um, we can look in our charts, we can collect our documents, um, we need to educate ourselves as much as possible. Um, now that's at the patient level. Now at the institutional level, patients can engage in governance, we can get engaged in walk-arounds, we can engage in creating hospital policy, we can get engaged in writing uh, patient materials. Um, then outside of the institutional level, patients and patient organizations really can get engaged in driving policy change, helping create research agendas, um, looking at payment models. So there's almost three levels of patient engagement where we can prevent, help prevent diagnostic errors from the personal to the institutional to the larger you know, medical education, policy, research, um, and implementation. David, thoughts? And at the executive level, I think carrying the message out to make sure that 
everybody is inculcated uh, into the, what the institutional values are, that we value patient feedback. We want that feedback. We welcome it. And that means every prov provider has to be willing to accept criticism or comments or information feedback from patients when things go great or when things go badly. We use it to drive improvement. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we're out of time for Q&A. Great, uh, great questions and, and answers, thank you. Let's review our program objectives and the key points we've learned today. Our first objective was describe the issues regarding diagnostic errors in healthcare. I'll cover this one. Uh, earlier we discussed team-based care. Really, uh, I love Dr. Singh's comment, diagnosis is a team sport. Mm -hmm. uh, communication between those mm -hmm. team members, communication with the patient and their families, uh, communication between different physicians, primary care specialists, diagnostic experts, which is one of the things of IOM uh, report, pathology mm -hmm. and radiology play an improved role. Electronic health records, both their uh, promise in terms of communication and their detriment in terms of our focus on getting the information in there and not on the patient. And then uh, finally, this whole concept of patient engagement, both mm -hmm. formally through councils and one-on-one. -on -one. The second objective was identify resources available to healthcare organizations to address diagnostic errors. David, will you uh, t take the honors on this one and talk about it? Well, here's a case where we're in a, a golden age in many cases, and largely because of information technology. We have, first of all, the IOM report from September uh, on reducing, improving diagnosis. It talks about improving diagnosis, not so much reducing diagnostic errors. That's a great resource. Uh, we also heard Dr. Singh's discussion about the safer guides and guidelines. There are professional so societies who are actively in, uh, engaged in developing guidelines for clinical practice. And you want to make sure that your physicians are using those guidelines. They're evidence-based, they're supported by the profession, and they should be in use. Uh, we need to do a better job training our providers in how to document better. We need to encourage the use of risk stratification tools by our providers. And here again, looking using OPPE to look at who's doing it and who's not and improving behavior that way. We need to make the clinical decision support tools available at the bedside in real time. Uh, the use of checklists. There are any number of tools that are readily available and would help us do a better job right now, today. Great examples of leveraging IT for improvement. So. Finally, our third objective was discuss the ways in which healthcare organizations can engage patients and their families in reducing diagnostic errors. Sue, do you want to take this one? Sure, and this is, um, I mean, there's a considerable movement um, nationally, I would say, in terms of engaging patients. CMS is, you know, right now, you know, really sharing the importance of patient and family engagement. Um, IOM is sharing the importance of patient and family engagement. PCORI is sharing the importance of patient and family engagement in determining research questions and outcomes. So I think this is a, also the golden time, the golden opportunity to really look at this value, the value of incorporating patient and family engagement in what you do in your healthcare institutions. So again, invite your patient family community to be part mm -hmm. of the healthcare team. Um, invite them to ensure better outcomes. Encourage them to be eyes and ears for symptoms. Bring them into writing materials, policies, put them on governance. Mm -hmm. um, I think that you really need to make sure that the documents, um, that your patients collect the documents, that they're encouraged to collect their documents. Um, read their charts, know themselves. And another thing that I haven't said that I think is really important, two other things I wanna say. I wanna say that um, having an advocate in the hospital with you, having a mom, a wife, um, you know, uh, a friend, an advocate to be your eyes and ears, this is huge. So I think that that's one thing that patients can do to help prevent diagnostic errors is bring a buddy to the hospital, have him room in with you. Hospitals, make it accommodating and encourage people. Bring your, you know, encourage your patients to bring in an advocate, um, be part of that team. And I also want to say when patients are recognizing that there is a um, diagnostic error like taking place in the hospital, that there's a process to stop that, you know, pick up the phone or there's some process. Okay, great. Thank you, Sue. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have. Thank you, Sue and David, for sharing your insights with You're us. Welcome. And thank you to Dr. Hardeep Singh for sharing his expertise on diagnostic errors. And thank you for taking the time to join us today. We're at the end of our program. 
Special thanks to the Hospital Engagement Network for their ongoing support of this series. And now from the Partnership for Patients, I'm Dr. Robert Dean. Thank you for watching.